Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with Barbara Villette. Barbara is, uh, was a, a Life magazine writer. Uh, her husband, Gray Villette, was one of Life's uh, true genius photographers, and that's saying a lot. That was a good, good stable of photographers. She has a lot of history. She has a lot of knowledge, and I'm just so excited to talk to her today. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Ken. How are you doing? I'm, I'm okay. For my age, I'm doing pretty well. I'm still working part-time. What, what are you working on? Gray's archives, of course. I think, I think I'm donating to ICP and a couple of others. I know, uh, I know you've been talking a lot with the ICP. How's that, how's that coming along? Are they, well, are they? I, I believe that uh, Aaron Barnett is due here next Monday for three days to go through what I've cataloged for them. And we'll see what happens. Then comes the legal work, the donation work. It's all just, you know, necessary evils. No, I've, I've, I've heard this story from, from a lot of people, you know, us photographers, we, we pass on and then we leave our, our spouses and our family with this huge archive. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of a burden. It, it is. And I'm tired. I've been working on it perhaps for 10 years, but I finally got 18 boxes cataloged so that every, every print, I know where it is and there's more to do. Can you tell me, um, about your work as, as, a, as a writer, as a reporter for Life magazine? Well, I started in, that, in those days, of course, women didn't. They didn't do anything except put dots over words that men wrote. So I started as a researcher. <clears throat> and eventually, I seemed to have enough ideas that were visual <laughs> so that I got to do a lot of assignments with a variety of the great photographers. I worked with most all of them. And um, eventually I got my first bylines and then the bylines continued and, and it went from there, but it took a while. They sort of sat on women's heads, you know. We weren't supposed to be what we were, competent. <laughs> so, but that's in the past, I made it. There was Jane Howard, myself, and Dodie Hamblin. I think that's about it. What, uh, what, do you remember what year you got your first byline? Not really, but I remember the story very well. It was with Howard Socherek, and it was a, a school up in Spanish Harlem. We were, Dick Merriman had been the editor, and he wanted to do white flight not recognizing that had a that had a certain racist overtone to it. Um, I went out and found the school and it came, you know, the, the running title was These Children Are at Stake. And it Howard, who was known for hardware, military hardware, shot the most sensitive thing of kids in trouble, wonderful work. And the story ran big, and I had a, a byline, my first byline at the center, which traced the life of a little boy whom his kindergarten teacher let sleep in the coat closet because he couldn't sleep at home. Amazing. It was quite a, it was wonderful stuff. No, it sounds, it sounds amazing. And I've, I've never, I've never seen that story before. Um, it was called PS 105. That's <laughs> very well remembered. Wow. Tell me, uh, so you worked with all the photographers. Tell me what it was like to say, let's just, uh, did you, you worked with uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, Isie? I worked with Isie almost too much. Yeah. Isie, we were all pretty amused by Isie because many things started with I, Isie, and that was it. One time, <laughs> one time when we were out on assignment, uh, we were having dinner together, and he looked at my plate, which had two lamb chops on it, and he said, how did you get that? <laughs> because he always ordered the cheapest thing on the menu in order to save on his expense account. I mean, Isley was just in his own way too much, but he was also, um, he tended to see things and then redo them. So many, many times we were dealing with posed images 
which made, in my mind, uh, a difference because Howard and, and Gray, later Gray, of course, uh, Paul Schutzer, they shot straight on. They shot the way it was. And that, to me, was the essence of photojournalism. See it, catch it if you can, but don't repeat it for your own benefit and set it up. That's just me. I became an aficionado of what I call the purity stuff. It was, and there were a handful who shot that way. Yeah, I mean, I, you 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 bring up uh, an important point. Um, Izzy was known in his, you know, I, I knew him a little bit. You knew him quite well, but he was a uh, he was very good at self promotion. Yes, he was. But he also he had a wonderful eye. However, it was an eye that wanted to set up so that it, everything was I Izzy, and that was not to me the essence of photojournalism but I was pretty strict in my own taste. That's how, how did you develop that taste? I mean, I mean, my father was a sports editor for Fox movie tone news. I grew up in a world of visual and, um, you know, I go out, my dad would take me out on assignments to work with, not work with him, just stand there as a kid. But, you know, I guess it started that way. He was of course shooting movie tone film, but it was it was as things happened, and so it was natural to me that photojournalism, when I landed at Life, should be as things happened. So you were you were a cradle born uh, purist. I think so. I'm not sure. It just happened that way. Well, it's it's so interesting to me because uh, in the early years of photojournalism, certainly when Life first started out. It was, it was it was okay to set up pictures they didn't we hadn't have developed that that sense yet that's quite true yeah it, the the rule was set up right there were there were even instances where people double exposed because the moon was in the wrong place i won't name any names but you know just and then of course um going along working with with Sochirek, with schutzer and then gray and of course, Gray was to me the purest of the pure. From the moment he started to shoot, he just, he was like a big cat. He just moved around very silently and just concentrated at a level that was amazing to watch. And I knew he was um, something special. So, when did you fall in love with him? Three Watching days. him work? Yes. That's what did it. We met, <laughs> this isn't, other people have heard this story, but it's true. This was the assignment that ended up being in great essays from life. I had wanted to do, by then I had some, some weight, and I wanted to do um, a series of three essays, fame, wealth, and success as operative words in the American mm -hmm. lexicon that I thought kind of led people astray. The, the search for fame, the search for wealth, and the search for success. I'd lined up Monroe, Merriman did that story. Um, and a family down in Texas that gave every kid in the family a million dollars, no holds on it when they turned 18 to do anything they wanted. And a guy who was trying to develop a chain of foam rubber stores across America, Victor Sabatino. I had spent about a week with Victor and knew that this is what made Sammy run. It was perfectly clear to me that Victor would make a, a hell of a story. And though it was a crazy, you know, who was Victor Stabatino? What did life care about him? But it was the search for success anyway. He went out to send to LA and Gray was then working in the bureau in LA. And so they automatically assigned Gray to it. And Gray's first reaction to me was rather lofty. Um, it was coming into his turf and, you know, from, from New York to the bureau, kind of a, oh, come off it was the attitude. And, um, and so this, the first things he said to me was, I suppose you'd like a martini in that South African accent of his. <coughs> and I thought, oh, here we go. And of course I said, sure. 
and we went down to whatever it was, um, the bar in the basement of this, the L.A. Hilton. And I began to tell him what I saw in Victor, and he got very interested. And, at, and the next day we started the shoot, and I watched him, and I thought, oh, we are in. This, is, this man knows what he's doing. He's, he's so clear with what he's after. The first day he just warmed Victor by do, overshooting, just bang, 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 until Victor gave up noticing. Second day, we were into it, and um, when he walked me back to my hotel room door, he bent over and kissed me on my forehead, and he said, you're going to marry me on the second day. And on the third day, I said, you're right. Wow, you guys didn't mess around. I, it could have been the martinis, though. We don't... No, we didn't have any martinis <laughs> <laughs> after that first one. <laughs> Yeah, it was just, it, it was, uh, you know, it was a natural meeting, I think. Tell me, tell me how, so, so you, you were in the room, you were, you were there um, all, the as, time. all the time. That's amazing to me. Why? Um, I never had that opportunity to work with a, uh, rarely would a writer ever be that, that close to the, the picture making process. In my experience, I never had that. Well, I guess that, I, 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 I did actually once or twice, but never, never that intensely. You were working for Life uh, Two, weren't you? When the, yes, yes. The second, the second. That may have been the change because the original Life had a big staff, and and we we started out as researchers, but as reporters, you went with the photographer. You know, it was this step up thing, right? Um, so, so there, there's always, you know, there were two schools of thought as how you, how you uh, warmed up to a subject. One was you tried to slide into the pool without making any ripples. The other yeah. was you just jumped into the pool, made a big splash, and got it over with. It uh -huh. seems that Gray was of the second school. He'd 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 work it hard. He'd let his cameras clatter around. The person would get used to that, and then That's he'd right. start. He'd go on the prowl. And then he'd go on the prowl. That's right. right. So. And that first stuff was we both knew would fairly much be meaningless. I mean, it's just the noise. Right. Right. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, when you think about that and how we used to work at life, even, you know, the, the, the pale imitation of life that I worked at, um, shooting for two or three weeks was no, was, was normal. Yes. And you could, you could burn a couple days just uh, making noise and, and stumbling around and finding your way. I don't think that's a th that's not a thing anymore. How, how, I don't think it is either. What does that mean to the picture making process, the journalism process? Well, how to comment on that? Looking at your work, obviously, you made it work. Um, whether it was short term assignments or not, your eye was what mattered, and I guess that's what makes good journalism. <laughs> good photojournalism is seeing. I mean, I, I know I sound preposterous, but standing into, getting yourself in the middle of a situation and really seeing it, being sensitized to the nuances that are always there, the expressions, uh, the hand motions, the, the way people, right now, you're covering your nose, that's interesting. So, it, it was that, and Gray did that in spades, and I suppose I was pretty sensitized to seeing. So there's th th that's another that's another contrast, and you, you know, you, so if we and not to you know, Izzy Izzy was Izzy, and he, you know, ironically, his most famous image was a, a captured moment of spontaneity. Mm -hmm. um, but there is two different schools there. One. You know, they're they've got preconceived ideas. Absolutely. Kind of, you know, and they kind of go in, and they're gonna. I'm gonna get this picture, then I'm gonna, and it's very almost scripted. But the photographer. Fact, okay, go ahead. In fact, in the early days at the Weekly Life, 
they had scripted everything. The photographer would get a script and he was supposed to shoot it. And that made no sense to me, but we still had to write the script. So the reaction was, forget it. <laughs> you know, when I'd be out with the guys, I'd say, pay no attention. Let's get at what's really here. And that's, you, you and were I like was not directing. I was watching. My job was to watch and to take it in so that the text that went with the photographs would be true to the moment. So, so you're my, you're my dream writer as of this moment. <laughs> you know, the editors, the, it, it, the life you worked for, the second life, I felt was, had been taken over by the editorial staff that thought it made the photographs. It was true at life one that many of the senior editors thought that they were in charge of what the photographers did. It just didn't work that way. If you work the field enough and let the photographer alone and you had good ideas and immerse yourself in it with him or her, um, it worked, you produced. And, and I guess I was good at that, letting people alone. Lovely, I just, there's so, so the, the, the big cat approach where you're, where you're watching you're, you're intently watching and you're letting things happen in front of you. That's, that's when the real pictures happen. And that's what was so, I mean, I don't, I didn't know gray, but I know his work and that's something that not a lot of people can do. There's a magic there. There's an art, 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 artistry to it. Um, it that was gray's character. You probably know that Gray never promoted himself. He never made much of himself. He preferred to disappear. Um, even to save his work after his death. It took a lot of effort because I knew what was there. But he hadn't done anything in the way of self-promotion. He never sold himself. He was very humble. He, was, he kept it simple. And, and that was the beauty of not only the work, but of Gray. He was so empathetic to life. He was lowercase. He was with it all the time. An amazing man. Obviously, I loved him. No, obviously. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was the photographer that could photograph. He was, uh, so I was talking to Rick Smolin just yesterday, <laughs> and Rick is the guy, I, do you know Rick? He sent me a copy of a book of, of a movie that he did and said to me that Gray, he, was, he had snuck his way into, I think it was the 29th floor, and he ran into Gray and, um, and Gray asked him, I guess, who he was, and he said he was trying to see, I don't know who the picture editor was then. It was John Lowengard. Was Lowengard, I thought maybe it was Lowengard. Um, and so Gray directed him and took him to Lowengard and introduced him to Lowengard. That I knew. And he went from there, he began getting assignments. Well, Rick was, a, Rick was still living at college at that point, and he was way, way over his head. He was, he was in the deep water, and Gray threw him a lifeline and jump-started his career just by walking him into uh, Lowengard's Low office. Lowengard's office, yeah. yeah. And, and Rick credits him today. And, and I, I just assumed that, that he knew Gray. And he said that's the only time they ever met. Only time he ever met him. Yeah. Change, so Gray changed this, this young photographer's life the first time he met him. And that was... He did that with Priya Ramraka. Um, Indian, African photographers. He did it for Peter Makabani in South Africa. He promoted other photographers all the time. He loved his work and, and he respected the guys who were doing it. So Gray was a very generous man in every way. Do you think that's a disservice to that type of photographer? The one that, uh, you know, that makes the lasting images, but then they can't promote themselves or they just don't care to promote themselves. Does that do their work a disservice in the long term, do you think? Yes, I do. I do. I think Gray's inability to realize that some of the stuff he was doing 
should outlast him. Um, but when life folded, it took a big, big piece out of Gray's heart. He just put his cameras down. He put them in a, a cabinet here in the house that I still live in. And he never, he seldom picked them up again. He did, he did take a few assignments. Ted Russell at Newsweek was a close, well, he was a friend and admirer of Gray's. And so he kept giving Gray assignments that pulled him out. But, um, it was a very rough period for Gray when life folded because life had been his life in a way. No, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, a, it was a, the death of a, a, a parent, a family member. It was, it was yeah, serious it was stuff. Huge. It was huge. Yeah. But we survived. Right. Eventually the nice thing, I know this has nothing to do with photography, but eventually because we both had a certain degree of wanderlust, just built in. We bought an old Airstream and took off in it. And that was wonderful. We would leave home in, in November and get, and go down, you know, sometimes into Mexico. And then we'd follow the spring home. And that was good, but he didn't shoot anything. He never took a photograph on those trips. Do you think his heart was just broken? To some degree, it took a big piece out of his heart, yes. But then wait now, the other thing you don't know about Gray is that he had always wanted to be a sculptor. Huh. And so he took up wood carving and my, the house is full of big pieces that he carved, they're beautiful. He also started building furniture and you know, he couldn't, he was a fountain, he couldn't stop being creative. He just kept making things. If it wasn't photographs, it was carvings, it was, my kitchen is all his work and so on. So he picked himself up, but for a while it was really rough. Do you consider Gray, even before he started carving and sculpting and stuff, but just with a camera in his hand, do you consider him an artist? I do. No question. You couldn't, the eye was so marvelous, you know, just wait for the moment and then and he framed as you all do, you know, I look at the contacts and I look, I look at the negatives. I have to tell you one story in Montgomery, he was in the church. And um, so I had the negs and I was um, digitalizing from them. And I go through and I look and I thought, oh my God, there are two frames. One of them is Rosa Parks and she's benign and she's smiling and she's looking out at everybody. And in the next frame, She's, her head is turned and she's furious. And I'm saying to myself, that's the real Rosa. It was the long lens going off. It was bang. And she had heard it and turned around and, and he, he only shot two frames on her. But that's the kind of thing. He waited, he watched. That's a, an amazing photograph. Um, you know, this uh, this, intensity that uh, photographers like that uh, bring to the bring to the table it, it 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 takes a burden on them as well and i'm just wondering did you see him exhausted at the end of the day did you see that that intensity of looking what did that did that yes. bear on him yes it did and he drank too much that's what would happen at the end of the day. Gray would drink, not a vast amount, but it, he just let himself down. Yeah, he was exhausted. I mean, it takes its toll. And he it, died it, young. It, how old was he when he died? Seventy-two. Yeah. Yeah, that is young. What? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I feel like putting down my cameras all the time and uh when i hear that gray put down his cameras at some point um it seems it seems you know like uh i'm following a similar path to that uh i'm not a, i'm not the type of photographer he was and i don't i'm not saying yeah, that but stop it some of your work is right there cut it out i've looked at it Okay, well, I'm humble. I'm a little bit humble, not as humble you as- You are not, uh, you shouldn't be. You should be proud of you. 
<laughs> Sorry. You As you know, I really like photographers. The, 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 I mean, like Crowley. Crowley knocks me out. And Steve he is Crowley's both. the best. Uh, Steve Crowley is a wonderful human being on top of everything else. Yeah. As, as well as a superb photographer. Yeah. And on we go. Epridge. Epridge was as funny as he could be and sweet and genuine, all the rest. I didn't work with Bill, but I had great affection for Bill. But, you know, Bill, Bill had his heart broken, too. Yeah. I mean, this take the, 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 the art, the, the, the act of seeing, act of seeing that deeply, it, 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 uh, you can't unsee that stuff. You can't. Your just... war stuff. I don't know how you survived your own work. Heavy. Yeah. So this, this, uh, can we look at some pictures here? Do you mind? Sure. Okay. Sure. Let me pull this up for us. Oh, there we go. Who who's this lovely couple? Look at them. <laughs> That's on a lash of success. That's the two of us. I mean, you're just so the two of you are. Do you look like you 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 stepped off the pages of uh, Harper Bazaar? I mean, I wish I could dress like Gray. <laughs> Most of the time, it was blue denim shirts and jeans. Oh, it's just lovely. But this time he's spiffy. Yeah. And a nice smile. That's I love probably that more photo. accurate, right? Yeah. That's that's that's, that's the accurate. working photographer for real. Yep. Also, I could tell when he was when his mouth was like that that he was getting what he wanted. It's really? like he was swallowing the image whole. Nice. Yeah. I love that. I do too. That's a favorite picture. Oh, this, this is probably, I'll, I'll let you talk. No, no, you, yeah, you talk. Uh, I'm just saying this is, this is one of the rare images that I have not seen before. I know what the situation is. I know how important and telling this image is. It's, it's a huge image. But I'm sure uh, a lot of, you know, most of the people that are watch this don't even know. So just tell us what's happening, why it's such a, a, a moment. It's because it's Kennedy-Nixon debate and Gray shot it because Nixon had not put any makeup on. Kennedy was well made up and Nixon was sweating heavily and Kennedy was so telegenic that obviously people took to Kennedy and the sweaty, creepy sort of Nixon lost it right here. And that's why this image is so important. And the wisdom to shoot it is important. That's, that's what I'm getting at, because this is happening in real time. And Gray, realized, he's realizing he what's happening. Yes, he got exactly what was happening. And this is the first televised presidential debate. Yep. And the people that listened to the debate on the radio thought Nixon won. The people that watched it on TV. It was because of the... The, the physical evidence was there. Nixon was sickly. And so this is uh, this was this is the future right here. We're looking at this is this is every presidential race in the Since future. Since then, yeah. And the games that have been played with it. No, I mean the first uh, the first uh, White House I shot in was uh, the Reagan White House. Oh, very. And that was, the, the visuals trumped everything at that point. It's all showbiz. That's what's crept in. Television you, in a way, in its own way, television has semi-corrupted things because they're all playing to the, to the cameras. Right. Certainly Trump, oh my God. Right. And then when you look back to say, Roosevelt, um, right. who was in a wheelchair, but most of America probably didn't even know that because yes, was... he kept himself secret in that sense, absolutely, right. and and would struggle to stand up straight. Good God, I was alive then. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh. Oh yeah, that's that's just the moment. Uh, that's Ernest Green in front, and it's the Montgomery. It's it's no Little Rock. That's it's Little Rock. as they were told by the judge that they could um, go to Little Rock High School. It's the moment of the judgment. How long did Gray spend down there? Just out of curiosity. Um. I don't really know. Uh, he was certainly, you know the story of what happened, don't you? Sure. That, that you, can, were... you can tell us, please. <laughs> well, after this, the streets lined, and there's another image, I don't know if you have it, but it's one that gets missed, and, and I think it's extremely important. It's a street scene, and on both sides of, on, on the left hand side, it's just all white people standing in protest and in the semi foreground on the left hand side there's one dark skinned man wearing a beret and holding a camera whom gray recognized as a photographer for the lo local black newspaper gray was working the crowd and there were motorcycles moving toward them and a cop coming towards gray and another cop approaching this man wearing the beret and unless I've shown it to many people, and at first what they see is the street scene, and they see the whiteness of it. What they don't see is that this lone black individual with the cop threatening him with a billy club has a hand on his back. Somebody's trying to push him into a confrontation. It's a hell of an image, and it's often missed. On the right-hand side, the billy club is coming towards Gray. And within a couple of moments, they had knocked Nick Miller down onto the street and there was a, a war. And the mob chased the life people. And finally the cops came in and, and arrested them. And the last image that I saw of Gray is his walking out of the crowd. And what is he doing? The crowd is sort of pummeling him but he's got his arm up in the air with his long lens being held out of reach. Quite, quite the moment down there. People don't realize that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Yankee photographers from Life Magazine were often a target. Oh, definitely, in Little Rock, no question. It's yeah. right there in the photograph. They also don't realize that the, those those uh, black photographers from the local black newspapers, whether it was in Little Rock or Memphis, exactly. um, opened a lot of doors for the Life Magazine photographers. Yep. Like the the Life Magazine photographers couldn't get couldn't get to where they needed to be in that say that church in Montgomery or wh wherever it was without, without without the help. Right. This was New Year's Eve at San Quentin. This is a scary one. And this is a famous picture that I, I didn't even know Gray, this was Gray's, but I knew, I knew the image. Yeah, there he is. I, I, my reaction to it is that it, you're looking at the brainstem. This is the, uh, the madness the serpentine madness in his eyes. Reptilian. He's yeah. a reptile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's going on? <laughs> Crowley, Crowley sent me this contact sheet. Tell me about it. There's two selects. These are, these are Gray's choice. Uh -huh. it's, and, and it's, um, if you can go back, yeah, I just lost it for some it's reason. It's okay. I think it's um, Sugar Ray. It may be Sugar Ray, but it might be Fulmer. I'm not sure. I'm not sure right now. I'm having a senior moment. Um, it's so Frazier. Gray went out every Friday night to shoot Fight Night when we were living in Manhattan. Okay. He did it semi-freelance. Uh, it was not an assignment. And I'm having, as I said, a senior moment. I know the images, but I can't tell you who it is. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know who it is either, but I'll tell you what I see. I mean, it's very interesting. There's two things that he's shooting plus X here, which is 125 ISO film. And you can see how bright that the mat is. So he strobed this, he set up strobes to shoot this. And in one roll, he's got, and boxing is very tough. But when you're shooting with strobes, you're shooting the the moment. You're not trying to let the motor do the job. You're, you you have to shoot moment by moment and anticipate and all that. And a lot of time, what you're looking at is the shoulder. Not you're not looking at. By the time the fist is moving, it's too late. But if you watch the shoulder, that's when you make. And so in one roll of film here, he's got two really good images. That's that's my takeaway. And since it's on plus X, if we printed these today, if we scanned and printed them today, they'd be like, um, you know, uh, raging bull type of Martin Scorsese quality. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just beautiful. Um, they're just gorgeous images. Yeah. And you can see even the way he lit it. It's just so cinematic. It's beautiful. That was my takeaway. This, uh, I just wanted to share this. Uh, this is from the book you mentioned, uh, The Great Essays. It's not the actual mm -hmm. magazine, but it's from, it's reproduced in this book, The Great Essays of uh, Life magazine. And it's such a beautiful opening spread. It's just... Rearview mirror of the car. It's just beautiful, isn't it? Yep. That's and a double Victor. truck. Double truck, Victor. Those yeah. eyes, the fierceness in those eyes. It's it's. Uh, I mean, to say to say, with so few elements, to use that as an opener. It's a such a bold. Uh, I mean, sometimes life really nailed it, and this is just one of those. That's all I'm saying. It's just we worked beautiful. with Bob Clive, who should get some credit. He was the uh, one of the art directors, but he would listen to us. We did our own layouts with Bob, and we laid out uh, Lash together with Clive. And I think this was Gray's choice. But you know, there was so much going on. I do not remember the layout sessions in their entirety. I just know that we did it together. I had no idea you guys had that kind of uh, ability. We did. We would get. We were kind of spoiled. <laughs> yeah, you were. You, we, you're, you were the stars. Huh? You were the stars. Well, I don't think. I don't think that's true. I think we were just insistent that the work get done. No, it's but beautiful. We had a lot of freedom. I will say that. And Clive loved doing it that way. You know, I mean, we just sequester ourselves this was george hunt he gave us so much freedom as managing editor it was right. he he was a great editor for life but it so be it i just think it's such a bold choice and so who made so was the film developed in life's lab yes and who did the prints did they did the do the prints in the lab they did the prints in the lab. Gray very often, st when, when I, I, most of the time, if we came, if he came in, if we were in the office with the film, if we weren't shipping, in this case, we were in the office with the film, he would go down to the lab and he'd oversee the printing with the, the printer. I don't know which printers did the work. I should, but I don't. Um, <clears throat> But Gray didn't, he thought these guys were specialists. They knew what they were doing. They were better at it than he was. And he would just stand there and say, I'd like to get. Or he put markings on his contact sheets with instructions where he wanted to lift or, you know, that watch the tones or whatever. So he used, he used his own eye in terms of developing stuff, but he didn't try and do the developing. He stayed with it as much as he could. Nice. That's such great knowledge. Yeah. Look at the lighting on that, huh? Victor and his daughter. You can see why Victor intrigued me. A very expressive guy. Very bright. Very sad. Very driven. This looks like, uh, it looks like a still scene from Death of a Salesman. 
it had that quality. I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking. It's kind of yeah, um, because it's he lost tender, it. but it's not. <laughs> Victor lost it all. It was terrible, and I really, I still have some guilt about it. But it was Victor's own doing. Can you tell me just, uh, I don't want to take away from the image itself, but is this full frame, do you remember? Or is this Yes, cropped? that's full frame, and there's no cropping. There just you go. Just shot it. There you have it. That's, uh, that's, that's working at a different level right there, Barbara. I know. <laughs> that too. That's a good one, huh? Yep. That's a keeper. That's so, again, that's full frame. Wow. It's a complete image, every, every line. And, and that's what, you know, when you talk about the, the street scene uh, in Little Rock, mm -hmm. none of that, and people don't realize, people think photographers are lucky. And they don't realize that everything they see, the good ones, the gravelettes out there, they know everything in that frame, in that every element in yeah. there. They're, 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 in they're taking second. account of it. There's a wizardry. It is magic. Mm -hmm. You know, the squares, the rectangles in the frame, the, the way so, the space is used. It's, and the tongue in the corner of his mouth. It's, it's just, just such a high level. So good. <laughs> love it it's a picture that is should be boring but you can look at it for hours <laughs> thank you for gray oh that's that's victor's grandfather who did not approve of his grandson didn't like his fancy clothes because he, he's, this is a guy who worked for a living worked very hard for a living as a baker yeah he's got it's and so he's not, he's not sure he likes that newfangled uh, business stuff, right? Yeah, man in a suit, fancy yeah. suit. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, 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 story, it's such deep narrative storytelling. And once again, everything is framed. I mean, even, even the shadows uh, of the silhouette on the left side. I yeah. love looking at Gray's work. I get lost in the boxes in the house. I, that's, it's, sure. it's going to be very difficult to give it all up. I'm sure. But the, 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 the silhouette of, of Lash bouncing off the, the, the same type of shape on the, on the, on the baking trays, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's magic. Oops, Thank I got two of those. This I love. <laughs> Oh, so good. Yeah, the corner of the caddy. He always had a white caddy wherever he went. I mean, Anybody? it's... Hmm? This was his closest friend who left him. Yeah, I mean, it's like somebody's going to get whacked, right? Yeah. Somebody's going to end up in a ditch somewhere. It's such a heartbreaking image. And the, that... L.A. sprawled out behind him, the the young L.A. even at that point. What the the, the future is? It's it's amazing. I managed to record that conversation, by the way. I was using wow. a tape recorder. It was a very sad conversation. It went on about why did you leave me and so forth. No, you can tell. You can tell. That's, it's, yeah. It's just. And you know, I don't need to even know the backstory. Is it's that's that's the power of images made by by a real photographer. So this is probably Gray's most famous body of work, which is almost accidental. Came late. Uh, he went he went down with um, the reporter from the Washington bureau who had recognized a court decision that meant that the Loving's question was heading to the, could head to the Supreme Court. And um, I was not on this. It was, it, in a way that was 
this was lucky because we own this one. This was gray shooting freelance. And um, it's among the ones that's managed to lift his name back into prominence and led to other things so that I'm able to get, you know, more notice for him. I just want his work to stay alive because for me, Gray was a great, great photographer. You don't lose that stuff. And, but as far as that Gray was concerned, yesterday was always yesterday. He didn't promote it, didn't do anything with it. So I'm stubborn. So I've done what I could with it. Well, you're, you're, you're his champion. I think for him, yes, yeah. for sure. Why not? <laughs> uh, tell me, tell me, how, tell me about this image a little bit. It's just that Richard is the difference between these two people is what's remarkable. Mildred, Richard adored Mildred, and she, she was, pardon me, she was a lot smarter than Richard. Richard didn't think that they should go to court. Richard didn't. He thought maybe Basile would forgive them and things would get better. That was the judge who condemned them at first. Um, but as you know, Mildred was the one who thought her way through, wrote to Bobby Kennedy, uh, got some advice, pursued things, and it ended up in the court case that has changed America. So um, this moment, it's, in, it's depicted in the film, on the, the loggings. Yeah. And uh, they kind of they kind of made it, if I'm remembering correctly, they kind of made it like the photographer was sneaking the picture in the movie. It was and, it was Michael Shannon and it was idiotic. He was lighting lying on the floor. He wasn't looking <laughs> reflex camera, he wasn't looking through it. He just was shooting, you know. It was silly, but they didn't get it. But what what uh, what people don't realize that uh, have never they 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 always kind of think that that somehow these photographers are just they're either lucky or they're sneaky or they've got alternative motives. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? But <laughs> kind of. But really, it's it's it's. It, the photographer is involved in a dance with the subject and the subject absolutely the subject knows exactly what's going on and even to use that word subject isn't their 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 dance partner is what they are they know what's happening here they are fully fully aware but by the time some time has passed and there's been a lot of a lot of shooting going on they get more relaxed you can watch it happen yeah so they they know what's going on, but they're used to it. It's part right, of life right, then. Right. And they've accepted this this yes. stranger into their home. Just this, he's here now. Oh, look, he's here now. We're watching television. Right. I love that one. Isn't this lovely? Yeah. It's such a simple, on the surface, it's such a simple frame. Yeah, but there's a barrier between them. There's a white barrier between them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to get too symbolic on us, but... Uh, but there, well, you know, you see what you see. And it's not an accident. None of these images are an accident. No. Oh, my gosh. That's a long time ago. I just this... found this on the internet. I'm sorry. I don't even know what it's from. It's, it's a lovely I image. I think that... I just don't know. I don't know this. It could be uh, the Vietnam vet who went back for his child and at the school, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know this image. You know what's amazing about it? It's um, it's it's not set up. <laughs> no, it's definitely not set up. But it's like this. I mean, it's, it almost makes you tearful. It's just such a beautiful Yeah, they're image. so sweet, and they're so mixed. Oh, yeah, gay lib. I this was mean, a reenactment I, of Stonewall. And he so, was out on his own. So he was just out, and so what, just 
I'm curious, what's well, the story it was, here? It, it was a reenactment of the Stonewall, the anniversary of Stonewall. And there was a gay lib march in Manhattan and he went out and shot it. I think that's on 6th, 6th and, and, and Greenwich. Not, I think uh, so. You know, it's right by that tobacco store, I think. Yep. We lived right around the corner. Did you? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is just a lovely image. Yeah. Mildred and... Yeah. I love the... Uh, I love the things, the little things, like the, uh, like the, those 60s style curlers that hair curlers and that so women forth. used to wear. And then we're back to the, to the beginning the two of us. this lovely, fashionable couple. <laughs> we had a great life together. Okay, we're back. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Barbara. That's just, thank you for sharing. Thank you for, uh, for keeping uh, Gray's work alive and, and allowing other people to see it. We're going to, uh, I'm going to find a link for that uh, Life uh, Great Photo Essays book, which the only person I know that even owns it is Steve Crowley, but he's, you know, he's a special, special one in his own way. He, he digs up these things. Um, I have one copy. I don't even know if it's available. I, I've never, I, I got to find it to see if it's available. Mm -hmm. So you want, I have somebody who searches for books very well. I can ask her to look for you. No, I'll, I'll search online okay. today. I'll, okay. I'll see if it's even, even available. Um, is there any other books that, that are out there that have a lot of Gray's work? We did a lot of books, not a lot. We did several books together. We did a book called Those Whom God Chooses. It was from a two-part essay on vocation. And it's all Gray's images uh, of the Marist missionary sisters. They're very beautiful images. I wrote the text. It's his photographs. We did, um, obviously, the Lovings book this last year I did alone with my daughter doing, Gray's daughter doing the layouts on that. And then in between, um, I wrote a fairly, well, I was proud of it, a, a book on South Africa called Blood River. It got a time notable and was nominated for a Pulitzer. And it has some of Gray's um, photo, some of Gray's photograph of South Africa in it. There are many more sitting here in negatives that I don't know quite what to do with. Um, but anyway. So I would recommend, as far as photography, that Those Whom God Shoot is, it was done by Viking uh, Swiss Reviewer. It is a beautiful book. And you can find it. People do find it. Great. I'll, I'll, link, to, I'll, I'll link to a few of those. I'll definitely link, link to the, uh, the Loving book. I didn't know that Gray's daughter uh, laid it out. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. to know. Well, yep. thank you, thank Barbara. You. Now, thank you, and lovely to meet you this way. Lovely to meet you. God bless. God bless, and thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.